live from Boston, Massachusetts, it's The Cube, covering Red Hat Summit 2019, brought to you by Red Hat. Well, good morning. Welcome back to our live coverage here in Boston. We're at the BCEC, and we're at Red Hat Summit 2019. You're watching exclusive coverage here on theCUBE. This is day three of three great days here at the summit. Stu Miniman, John Walls, and we're joined now by Paul Cormier, who is the president of products and technologies at Red Hat. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, guys. How are you, How are you doing? I'm doing great. Great, so are we. Uh, wonderful job on the, on the keynote stage yesterday, and we're going to jump into that a little bit. Uh, but I wanted to run something by you here. Sure. A, a great man w once said, every great achievement begins with a bold goal. I heard that somewhere. I'm looking at that man, yeah. So you know, one of the many statements that I thought really jumped out yesterday. Let's talk about that in terms of just the Red Hat philosophy, uh, what's happened with RHEL 8, where you've gone with uh, OpenShift 4, and just how that is embedded in your mind to how Red Hat goes about its business. Well, you know, we've, we've, um, we've been in the enterprise space for 17 plus years, and prior to that, um, Red Hat, you know, we were basically uh, through the retail through the retail channel, but first and foremost, Red Hat started as an open source company. Mm -hmm. That's where they started, not as an enterprise company. Once we decided with the bold goal that we're going to get this into the enterprise, that's where we really set, you know, really transformed into what you've maybe heard before from out of my mouth is, we're, we're, we're not an open source company, although everything we do is open source, we're an enterprise software company with an open source development model. Mm -hmm. That was kind of the beginning of the first bold goal. Let's get Linux to the enterprise. Mm -hmm. And so that's sort of how we've uh, thought about it from day one, is let's take it one step at a time. You know, as I said, get Linux in the enterprise. Make, make RHEL the operating system of the enterprise. Now let's take on virtualization, first Zen, then KVM. And then as th that all happens, so much innovation happened around Linux that all these other pieces came. You know, Hadoop, Kubernetes, all the other pieces, so we just, kept growing with that because it's all intertwined with Linux. That's mm -hmm. one step at a time. Yeah, so Paul, before we get off this point, I want you to put a fine point on it for our audience because you look out there, you know, open source is not a community, it's lots of communities. Right. And it's not, you know, one thing, it's many things out there. And today people will look at, there's certain companies, how do I create IP and monetize what we're doing and, you know, where the project and the company are, you know, sometimes intertwined and licensing models changing. You know, Red Hat has a very simple philosophy on it and it's not something that's necessarily easily replicatable. Yeah, I mean, the, sim the simple philosophy is, it's, op it's, it's upstream first, that, that's, that's our philosophy. Yes, we are a business, and certainly making our products successful is, 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 is important, number, number, number one goal. Number zero goal before that is make the project successful. Our products can't be successful unless we're, mm -hmm. we're built on a successful project. And it's not something that we even think about because it's just ingrained, it's, it's, it's in our DNA. So, I mean, I'll give you examples. You know, even Kubernetes. Um, we didn't start the project, Google started the project. But we knew in order, to, if we were going to incorporate that in a big way into our products, that we had to be prominent in the community. So, that's what we did first. And then it rolled out into the products. It's just ingrained, it's in the DNA. Yeah, so let, let's talk a little bit about Kubernetes. Uh, yeah, OpenShift, you've now got over a thousand customers. Congratulations on Thank that. You. And OpenShift 4, we've spent a bunch of time talking with the team. But let's start a little bit higher level because you know, there's dozens of you know, Kubernetes options out there. Uh, people look at, is there interoperability between them? You know, in the early days, customers would just spin their own pieces, and um, you know, today every cloud provider has at least one option, if not multiple options, and there's all the independent. How does this play out? You know, where are we along the maturity, and how do all these pieces fit together, or do they? Well, I mean, if you look, if you look at Kubernetes, I mean, the, the thing here, here's the, the the good news. The good news is open source has become so prominent and in, in everywhere. We we're now ourselves included. We make this mistake ourselves we've confused projects with products. Mm -hmm. So Kubernetes is a project, it's a development project. And we all talk about that like it's a product. The same, it's the same thing with Linux. So I'll give you an example. The Linux kernel, we're all, you know, all the commercial vendors and everyone else is in that same upstream development tree with the Linux kernel. But when the commercial guys like ourselves, when we go to build a product, we make 
choices of which file systems we're going to support, which installers we're going to support, you know, what we're going to do for management, what we're going to support for storage, and for many reasons we all make different decisions. So that's why at the end of the day when we come down to our products, even though they're all completely open, you know, RHEL is different from SUSE, which is different from Ubuntu, mm -hmm. which is different from all the others. It's the same exact thing with Kubernetes. We all develop here, but now we bring that down into a platform like OpenShift, that R Kubernetes touches user space APIs, it touches kernel a a APIs, and so unless you, you integrate those and they all move forward in the mm -hmm. life cycle of that platform at the same time, we get out of sync with each other. And that's one of the reasons why it's a product and they don't necessarily work across each other with, you know, with all the other products. And it's the same exact principle that made RHEL and it's the same exact principle how Linux works. Right, so w what advice do you give to customers as to how they look at this? Because they're like, <laughs> oh wait, there's now Azure and OpenShift, this jointly offered solution, but do I use that or do I use the native you know, AKS solution out there? You've got partnership with the AWS. You know, where does OpenShift versus Anthos on Google right. fit? It, it, it definitely is a little bit fragmented. Well, the, the, th the other thing that's happened around the cloud, one of the things that happened in early in the cloud, a lot of the cloud providers said every application is going to the cloud tomorrow. I think that was 10 years ago. And the last number I thought, sorry, we're about 20% there. And so, and, and that's great, we think that's great, but customers still have on-premise applications and they have, they're running on-premise either bare metal, virtual machines, they have their own private clouds in many cases, and now they want to go across clouds. Every customer I talk to, and it's not just for lock-in, that's definitely a, an issue. They want to go across clouds because this cloud provider might have a better service here than that cloud provider and vice versa. So what customers want to do is they want one common operating environment, mm -hmm. both for the applications developer and the operators. They, they can't afford to have five different silos because just like the example I used with Linux distributions being different, every one of these Kubernetes distributions is different. And so Anthos, for example, if you're going to have all your applications, including bare metal applications on Google Linux, then that's good because your operators have one operating environment, your developers have one development environment, but that's impractical. And that's why that's, that's not going to work. I mean, the reason why I think Microsoft is one of our best partners here is they understand this, which is why they've embraced OpenShift um, so, so deeply, even though they have AKS in their stable. And the reason why I think they understand this is because they, like us, have been in the enterprise space for a long time. This is how enterprise computing works. And I think that's the model that our customers, it's, it's, they don't have no choice to deploy. They just can't afford to have five different you know, operating environments. It's like the Unix days. It's like the Unix days all over again. And you know, um, when you had one vertical stack mm -hmm. and you know, you, customers started to roll out a common stack. That's why RHEL succeeded, because we gave them that commonality and they couldn't afford five different silos to try to manage and develop their applications to. You know, is there a different rhythm or a unique rhythm to the open source community in terms of development, in terms of new products that might be a little different than than old, older models, because you know, if, I'm just saying, if, I, if if there's an interest that focuses maybe in one area and the interest shifts over, you know, or momentum shifts over to a different direction, and and maybe this standard or this old kind of lo loses a little bit of its impetus or its force. I mean, that creates uh, decision challenges sure. on the <coughs> customer side. But but it, absolutely, and and that's why, as I said, even with Kubernetes. We didn't jump in full force exactly right away. Um, you know, we sort of we sort of worked in many of there were many uh, co uh, container orchestration technologies out there. Some, most of which, besides Kubernetes, have gone by the wayside a bit now. Mm -hmm. And you know, we sort of sort of look at that and see where it goes. See how and this we, plays you know, out. We, kinda, well, well yeah. we get involved, but we also try to make make the best technical decision as well. Kubernetes now, it's got way too much momentum. And, mm -hmm. and, and, the, and with open source, um, because it's got so much momentum, that's where the innovation's happening. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, customers, even though they have confused many projects with products, they still want, they still want the right technology to solve their business bus mm -hmm. problems, right? And so K Kubernetes has so much momentum around it, that's where the in innovation's happening. So that's, 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 the plat that's the big part of the platform right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's, the other thing I think that a lot of people that try to jump into this space miss is, 
if you're going to base your enterprise product on an upstream project, you better have good influence in that upstream project right. because when your customers ask you to address an issue or, or take it in a direction mm -hmm. or help take it in a direction, if you don't have that influence, you can't satisfy your customers. Mm -hmm. So we learned very, very early on that upstream is, is not a bolt-on for us. It's an integral part that mm -hmm. starts even before the product starts. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, Paul, uh, I've heard many people often call Red Hat the Switzerland of IT. You know, being where you sit in the community, and you know, for years at this show, we've interviewed you know all of the hardware players and everything like that. Sorry, sorry, um, sorry about take that. Time. Important calls. Sorry. It's no worries. Sorry. You know, live audience can wait. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll show you the clip of uh, John Cleese when uh, we got interrupted on a program once. Um, we won't. Throw I think water it was my admin you. telling me I needed to come here. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're good, but um, so. <laughs> you know, with Red Hat starting as that, as that Switzerland, when I look at the multi-cloud world, it's, you've got interesting combinations. You know, Satya Nadella up on stage is not something that we would have thought of right. uh, five years ago. Um, so, you know, VMware supporting OpenShift announced today is not something that many people will look at and be like, oh geez, you know, that seems surprising to me because you know, we have you know, fights over virtualization or various pieces of the stack. What do you see in kind of the software and multi-cloud world today that's maybe a little different than it was five or 10 years ago? Well, I think, I mean, to VMware's credit, they're trying to satisfy their customers and their customers are saying, I, I want OpenShift. And so we, we work with trying to satisfy our customers too. The Microsoft arrangement, I mean, as you guys probably well know, we weren't the best of friends, you know, five, six, seven, eight years ago. And, and I think Satya said it uh, on stage, and our customers got us together. Uh, literally, mm -hmm. we had a set of big customers that almost took us in a room and said, you guys need to talk. And, um, and frankly, I think they're one of our best partners right now. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure it could have happened without Satya, but um, they're, they're one of our best partners because we're both interested in satisfying our mm -hmm. customers. And, and as I said, I think Microsoft really understands the enterprise world and that's why we're going in a common direction. We almost, when we get in a room with their engineers, we almost complete each other's sentences of, mm -hmm. you know, when we start talking about what we need to do. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there, there's been an announcement I think early in the week. You had a, a, a global economic study done. IDC came up with this huge number, right? Ten trillion dollar impact that Linux is having uh, uh, globally speaking. Just uh, if you would, I mean, I'm just curious about your perspective on that. What kind of a statement that is, and and the dollar values that are achieved, or the incremental values that are achieved uh, in terms of uh, applying these technologies. I think it's a couple things. I, I think. I think it's a statement that this is the innovation model. So open source is the innovation model mm -hmm. going forward, period, end of story, full stop. And I think, as I said in my keynote yesterday, um, you know, leading up to the, the biggest acquisition ever for a software company, not an open source software company, a software company that happened to be an open source software company, I don't think there's any doubt that, that, that open source has won. Mm -hmm. here, here today, it, mm -hmm. and it's because of the pace of innovation. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, I mean, we've been at RHEL for 17 plus years, but we probably spent the first third or so of that 17 plus years trying to convince the world that Linux was secure and it mm -hmm. was stable and it was ready for the enterprise. Mm -hmm. Once we got through that hurdle, it was just off to the races from there. And mm -hmm. Kubernetes, what, you know, I said yesterday, containers came on the scene, although they've been here technically for a long time, they came on the scene in 14, mm -hmm. Kubernetes in 15. It's only 2019. It's mm -hmm. really not that far downstream. Where, we're, as you said, we've got a thousand commercial customers. And the keynote this morning, talking about some of the use cases uh, that we're solving with with OpenShift. I mean, Boston Children's Hospital is just un unbelievable of what they can do in a matter of a week that used to take them a matter of a month to do. Right. That's because of the innovation model. Right. Uh, we had Dr. Ellen Gray on yeah. yesterday, by the way, so if you haven't watched that yet, go back to the uh, <laughs> thecube.net and check that interview out. Yeah, I mean, fascinating co customer conversation we've had about transformation, but Paul, I want to get your, your take on the only constant in our industry, which is change. Um, I wrote right after the, uh, the announcement of the acquisition and meeting with your changes, Red Hat, the one thing that they've actually built themselves for is to deal with the massive amount of change. You know, you could tell better than more how fast the Linux kernel is changing. Uh, you know, a third of the code's changed in the last two years, and Kubernetes is 
actually n not as many lines of code as Linux, but it's massive amounts of change. Uh, I heard, you know, we relate out. It took right. about five years of development on that. Um, I heard the, the pace going forward will only get faster. Every three years you're going to have a major uh, release, every six months right. a minor release. So how do you get the team and the community and all these things you know, ever keeping up and uh, even turning it up to 11? That, that, yeah. that, that's, that's probably one of the biggest parts of our job. Our customers can't deal with that change. Right. You know, frankly, I think in the beginning, beginning of OpenStack, one of, the, one of the mistakes that we as a community did for our customers was there were some vendors out there trying to tell customers, you need to stay close to the head, to the upstream head. You need to stay close to the head. And we really all tried to get things out in six months. That's great to try to start to evaluate innovation and how, what you can do with that. It's not great for necessarily running a stable business on. Mm -hmm. and, that's what, and that's what I think our job is, is to help our customers consume open source developed technologies in a way that they can continue to run their business on. That was the goal, that was the audacious goal of RHEL from the beginning, mm -hmm. is that the model of RHEL, it's, and, and it's why it's, it's not necessarily about the bits because they're free. It's about the life cycle of that and how we can help our customers consume that. And that's what we do, that, frankly, to the core. Well, to, just to follow up on that, if you ask your customer and you say, hey, you're using Azure, what version are you using? They're like Microsoft patches and updates that constantly, exactly. as opposed to the traditional you know, Patch Tuesday in Windows. So right. you know, we seem to be closing that gap a little, but it's challenging between the stuff I control and the stuff that I consume. Well, we'll look at even OpenShift 4. We used, I mean, I know Ashesh was on yesterday talking about that, but we used a lot of the great technology we got from CoreOS to start to bring that model onto even on-premise, if, if you so choose, with OpenShift, because there's so many of the components that are, that are intertwined with each other. You know, you've got Kubernetes with talking to user space, talking to the kernel, user space talking to the kernel, talking to storage, talking to networking. So now automating that for our customers for that updates um, is, is, um, is what they want because that's how they consume it in the cloud. I remember when we first started RHEL, we used to put the, the, the features on the side of the box and the first <laughs> thing was what version of the kernel it was. That quickly went away too. They don't want to have to worry about that because they don't have the expertise to, do, to be a DIYer themselves. Well, congratulations, uh, Paul. Great week. Thank you very uh, much. Again, well done on the keynote stage yesterday. Fascinating stuff this morning, too. So, uh, well done on the programming side, and we wish you luck down the road, and don't forget to check your voicemail. Oh, I will. All Thank right, you guys very much. It might be important. All right, <laughs> Always right. a pleasure. Back with more here from Red Hat Summit 2019. You're watching us live here on theCUBE.